Welcome to the Minimalist CEO Podcast with Nate Lindquist. Nate created the Minimalist CEO Method to help business owners redefine and grow their businesses by finding new demand in places they never thought to look where there's no competition. By following his opposite thinking strategy, Nate's coaching clients have grown their business up to 40% in just two months and created tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Nate himself has launched more than 140 businesses. On the show, Nate interviews successful business owners and experts who share the secrets you can use to have a better business and a better life. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Nate Lindquist with the Minimalist CEO Podcast. We've got a special interview for you today. I'm here with the president of 1-800 Water Damage, but this guy's got an interesting background. Uh, he didn't just show up and start doing restoration and uh, you know helping mitigate the downside of property problems. He comes from, gosh, school administration, and I think sounds like police work. We're going to get to know, ladies and gentlemen, Tim Fagan. Tim, welcome to the Minimal CEO Podcast. Thanks for being on here. Thanks for having me, Nate. You got it. I feel like uh, this is going to be an interesting interview. I feel like it's oh god, what's there's a you have a little bit of like horsepower behind you know that we've only been talking for a few minutes here, and I get there's like this energy of like this guy is going to tell us some stuff. Like I, th- there's a vibe. So you may, I don't know if you feel that yet, but I'm looking forward to seeing where this interview goes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I want to start with, how did you get involved in business? What's the business that you're in? You're in the restoration space. How did you get into that space and where'd you come from? That's a loaded question. It is loaded. It started a carpet cleaning business uh, when I was in college. Mm-hmm teacher and a Hall of Fame football coach, high school coach in Michigan. And uh, he had switched school districts and got laid off like after a year when the uh, recession of the 80s, the early 80s hit. So uh, he started a carpet cleaning business. And uh, I was I was a wrestler at University of Michigan at the time and, uh, you know, full time student. And I was his part time free help at night. So I always did the seems like at the bars that would close at two in the morning. And then I'd come in with my dad and help him, you know, scrub the carpet there at the bars or the Chinese restaurants. And when they close at 11 PM, that was my early four way into carpet cleaning and uh, into his business. So when I got out of college, I got out, I left. I, uh, I was hired by the Washington County Sheriff Department and I became a sheriff deputy, went to the police academy and, and kind of ran from that the business for for a number of years, about eight, about fifteen years. And uh, by that time, I was a school police liaison, then a school administrator for seven years, and at a high school and a coach, a wrestling and a football coach. And uh, my dad was sixty five and asked that I take another look at the business, and uh, I did. I uh, I left school administration and coaching, and uh, and uh, went and helped him, and for. 15 years, just the time of my life, both running a business and I'm very close to my father and having lunch with him every day for 15 years is, was, was just a, uh, a hoot. And for those that are wondering, coach is still alive today. He's 89 years old and, uh, and uh, still doing well, just not as mobile as he used to be. Yeah. That's great that you're able to do this. So this is your father. He had a, a carpet cleaning business, dragged you yes, into it, did. which is yep. what dads do. And then, um, which is good. I mean, it's good because it, it taught you the ropes. It helped you get a work ethic. Also gave you a chance to run away from something towards something else, which yes, is like, that's right. I, I would rather have this. And I totally yeah. get that. I can relate to that. Yep. That's great that you had that relationship with your, with your father. I feel like I'm doing an interview with Nick Nolte and I'm a huge 48 hours fan. So there's like this Nick Nolte was a wrestler, became a sheriff deputy, went to the police academy worked with his dad in the carpet business and also did the movie 48 hours. I don't know if that's the first, <laughs> I don't know if this first time you're hearing know. that. <laughs> it's that's pretty cool. And if someone, you know, if someone's going to watch this on YouTube and, and go to the minimalist CEO channel and they're going to be like, yeah, he's right. This is well, Axel Foley is going to come out too. They're going to have like, uh, what was that? Uh, Beverly Hills cop. There's going to be like that whole intense, Anyways, I don't know where we're going with this. <laughs> it's all that whole time period. Yeah. yeah that's the whole time period. So uh, you ended up going back into the business. So specifically right now, what business are you in? 
Like what, what are you doing now? Like if you well, were, we're what much I more restoration business right now. I mean, if you were to ask generally what I do, yeah, we provide solutions to individuals and organizations that are affected by emergency catastrophes. Okay. We help them in all kinds of ways. Everyone says, oh, your name of the company is 800 water damage. Well, it, water damage is only part of what we do. Mm-hmm fire losses. We respond to their things that mean a lot to them. They have a great deal of sentimental value in restoring them. The mold losses that they have at their houses. Uh, a lot of times we just give them a name and a number to call. If it's something that that we don't do, but somebody else we work with does, again, that's part of being that solution for them to, to help them with that roof leak or that plumbing pipe leak or something like that. We don't do it, but we work with people that do every day and we know the good ones and we just make referrals to them. And we just hope that they keep us in mind if they have an issue later, you know, that is something that we can help them with. So that's how I look at it, Nate. I just look at, at being a servant and trying to help people, you know, sometimes restore order from chaos on the worst day of their life. Sometimes we're involved, sometimes we're not, but we can always be helpful. So you have, you, that's great. It's the right attitude, the right approach. And I've noticed that some, some people in the restoration space are just in it to make a bunch of money. But at the heart of it, there's a lot of people in this industry with the same spirit that you have in you that says, listen, I'm a servant. I mean, you know, if someone's going to have an emergency, it's going to be the worst moment of their life. You don't talk about the technical stuff. You'll get to that. But the idea is like, we're going to come out and we're going to be there for you. So you touched on something that I've noticed is, is a critical, like I, I would call it a, a linchpin for success in the restoration space, which is cultivating relationships, building referral partners. Would, would you say that's a significant component of the new business driving piece, You know, getting the marketing and the relationship building? Is that where your new business comes from primarily or what percentage? Would it's it critical. That part, a lot of people think, hey, I'm going to join this franchise network and you know, the search engine optimization piece of the, <coughs> the drive business or, you know, just because we're part of a, of a yellow truck or a blue truck or a green truck or an orange truck, that's going to drive business. But what drives repeat, repeat business is relationships. It's, it's the relationship before the need is what we like to say. I mean, I like to go to somebody. I want to develop that relationship before you need us, because that's when you're going to be relying on that relationship. And I'll give you just one example. Just okay, great. A week ago uh, in Michigan, we had some parts in the Detroit metro area had six inches of rain fall at one time. Okay. So anytime we have over three inches of rain, we're going to get four or 500 calls for service. We had six inches in some communities uh, near Detroit. And my phone started ringing. My text started popping with relationships that I've had in the 25 years that I've been in this business uh, for people, some I haven't talked to in 10 years, but we have a good relationship. We were there when they, when they called us, I was able to help them. In this case, we brought in about 14 different franchisees from out of Michigan uh, to come and help in this event. And uh, I guess in the end, we had over 30 crews on the road. Wow. Dispatch and losses to 30 crews, you can roll through a couple hundred leads pretty fast. So what are the referral partners that you're cultivating? I mean, if you're what industries or what you know, what business are they in that where you're building these pre-established relationships? They're in uh, property management, they're insurance agents, in some cases they're insurance adjusters. Um, there's people that you meet in schools, hospitals, universities, governmental agencies. And homeowners associations, chamber of commerce, these are all places where you want you, know, you want people to know who you are. So, and you want to develop a relationship. So, shoving a koozie in front of them or a coffee cup filled with candy might get their attention, but really, you have to develop that relationship. I think. How do you do that? I mean, how do you lock in the relationship so when that moment comes, they're like, "Calling Tim. I want. To, I want Tim." Well, there's a, a lot of different ways. Um, there's some theories on, uh, you know, the best ways to do it. There's some principles of influence that I implore. One is the law of reciprocity. I mean, if you find out what they want and what they need, 
uh, let's, I'll just take an insurance agent. Insurance agents in most states <coughs> see credits to keep their license. We became experts at delivering CE credits, uh, both in my dad's business and then in 2010, Belfour bought, I owned it at that time, but they bought the business from me. And, and now that my employees continue to work for Belfour uh, today, 11 years later, they're still there every day. Uh, now with, with Belfour, in 2018, I was asked to take over the president of 1-800-WATER-DAMAGE was a Belfour owned company, but it's different than Belfour property restoration. So uh, that's what I did. And now with the franchisees that I lead, we do the same thing. We offer CE credits, continuing education credits for agents. They need those. Property- how, do you, how do you do that? I mean, how, how do you tell me, can you maybe, so I'm a 10 year old or I'm someone in a business that doesn't understand the restoration space in from the perspective that you have. So you're talking about continuing education credits. Are you uh, are you guys teaching classes? Are you do you have online course material? How do you help them get these credits? And where do they find you to do it? We offer them online first, which is the easiest way to do it. And we have instructors online uh, for our more advanced franchisees. They offer them in person. <laughs> but it goes back to the theme that you asked is about. How do you develop those relationships before the need? And it, the theme really is find out what they need and how you can enhance them and their business or th- their personal life. I mean, if they're, if they, you know, their kid loves wrestling, I've gone to wrestling matches at the University of Michigan with clients and their sons that wrestle. And, you know, I got them in the locker room and I had them talk to the head coach and, those kind of things are things that are really important. So it's not necessarily like, you know, front row tickets to a Dell or something like that. Those are pretty pricey, but showing them that you care about them and you want to help to enhance the relationship and you'll go out of your way to do that. And you're hoping that they will as well. So if you were to, I mean, one of the, I think the sticking points that I've seen in a lot of different restoration companies is some are hard and fast. I don't want to, I don't necessarily need to be on an insurance company or adjuster's vendor list because there's this important boundary not to cross to trying to get in the favor, you know, and of of the insurance company while you try to advocate for your client. How do you navigate that boundary in a way where you can have those relationships? It sounds like insurance agents or adjusters are sort of top referral partners. Is that right? They can be. It depends on the market. Okay. So who else so might be a top be. referral? They're not always. Um, I had different branches that survived on uh, hospitals and universities. Just so, you, so because they have big, big properties, yep. institutional properties where there's going to be there's going to be claims regularly, roof leak, a little yep. flooded area, uh, some mold, whatever it is. Maybe now do you guys deal with fire at all? Fire restoration? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay so if if Suppose you, you're of the mind that says, listen, I, I'll be available to insurance companies, but we're going to advocate for our clients, which is, which is I think, a very strong stance, stance to take. And for some people, it's very important going in and, and putting the stakes in the ground with institutional relationships, hospital relationships, saying, listen, you know, if you ever see something, if you notice, you, tell, you talk to them about noticing damage, or if there's ever if something comes up, let us know. We'll come out and take a look at it, see what we can do to help out. Or how do you, I mean, how do you start the conversation with a hospital that's busy administrating an institutional function of, of healthcare and emergency services and all this other stuff. I mean, how do you even start that conversation? Well, I mean, you don't walk in the front door of the hospital or the administrative wing and say, Hey, I want to be a restoration contractor. You first you have to understand how they operate. Okay. And in hospitals, there's basically five pillars in hospitals. So I mean, we're getting into the, into the weeds a little bit as far as, You know, but if they've just had an outbreak of MRSA or let's say COVID, um, I could tell you that who's making decisions about who's getting into the hospital to do critical cleaning and flood work is probably their infection control department. But if they just got sued by something, it's probably their risk management department. It could be their facilities management department. I mean, it could be a lot of different areas in some hospitals the smaller ones, it's it's the people that take care of the, the housekeeping, the, the general janitorial 
type services that are take place in cleaning of, of each of the individual rooms. And those are all different, different entities that look at what needs to be done in a very unique perspective. Um, and some of them are controlled by hospital administration. The administration wants to control, you know, everything that happens in a hospital. The bigger the hospital, the less control they have through administration like that. But so they're having a lot of claims, like like for mold or water damage. Well, I just think of this: any place that has a lot of water, that have you know, in that case, every room has water, every room has gas. You know, there's fire hazards all over the place. Those are they're going to have incidences. Yeah. Anytime there's a pipe put in a building, I don't care if it's residential or commercial. The question isn't if it's going to leak, and I'm not. I'm just talking about supply or drain pipe. It's when it's going to leak. It, they, they will all leak at some point in their career. So you want to be the call, you know, when that happens, not drip, drip, but if they let loose, you want to be there at the top of the list. So you follow the pipe. That's it. I mean, so w- what I've generally seen, and, and maybe you also have this as part of your list, you didn't really list many, but the idea of like plumbers, electricians, people who are looking into properties all the yeah, time. Tradesmen. Yeah. Tradesmen. Yeah, so I would imagine partners with anyway, and can be referral sources. Right, you can be that's where law reciprocity. You can refer back to them too. Oh, of course. I mean, think of the mistakes their customers are making or running into problems with that they don't mitigate, that they don't solve. They're like, listen, we got to have someone, and if you become the expert and they can refer you, they're building stronger relationships. You're getting the business, and you can return the favor when the time. I got an email today, Nate from an agent, insurance agent, Detroit Metro area, that forwarded me an email from one of his clients that said, uh, forward me that, he he said, I'm forwarding you the the AOR, the agent of record paperwork, which means he's becoming the agent for this guy that he made a referral to on these floods that just happened in Michigan. And he called me and said, hey, can you help this guy? I'm trying to get his business and blah, blah, blah. And I sent a crew out to help him. And now he's got the guy's business. So, I mean, those are the kind of relationships. That's the law of reciprocity. I mean, I help him. Now he's got a new business. I think I got a deeper relationship with him. I think when there's another event that occurs, I think, you know, I, I have no doubt he's gonna, probably going to call or text or email me and and I'll take care of him again. And we'll develop that. We'll grow uh, that relationship. And those relationships last a long time. I just shared with you all the ones I got over the weekend. Yeah, that's great. I think it's the right approach. And I, I would say if you, if you were to maybe look back at your time in the restoration space, you've been in it for a while now. Um, what would you say would be the biggest turning point in your business? You know, sort of like I think of a turning point as I thought things were this way when I got into it. And then kind of like that epiphany moment where I realized it's really this and it made a big shift. What do you have any of those that you could share? Yeah. And when I, when I started in 95 and I left school administration during my dad's business, they did about $700,000 a year in sales and they had 17 employees and 90% of their work was carpet cleaning. Uh, One of my jobs was to become an estimator and I did fire estimates And then I did water estimates, water damage estimates. And it didn't take me very long to figure out. I went to my dad. I call him coach. I say, coach, this is not rocket science, but there's a lot more money in responding to people's needs 24-7 on the water side than it is scheduling nine to five on the carpet cleaning side and then doing commercial clients, you know, on the weekends or after hours or something like that. And we're, we're going to do much better on the water damage side. So that took me not very long. The, the thing that I underestimated was it's a different mindset. The 24-7 is more like, more like a fireman or a police officer or something that you go from zero to 60 in a short amount of time. You're, you're bored and you're, you're kind of sitting there talking to another, another deputy or another officer you know, uh, behind a store or something. And all of a sudden, you know, there's an emergency. And so you go from zero to 60 very quickly. And, uh, or the, the firemen that are sitting in the, in their firehouse, having breakfast or lunch. And all of a sudden the, uh, the alarms go off and now they got a three alarm fire going. 
but that's the kind of mentality of the employees that we were that we were looking to hire. Those that were really good carpet cleaning employees, we kept cleaning carpet and we kept those people as employees doing that, cross trained them in water. But you know, we really started looking outside for people that had that that kind of entrepreneurial uh, 24-7, uh, you know, a weekend is a suggestion type of thing, you know, that they 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 enjoy that, you know, getting into the fray when it's uh, everybody else is running from it and we're we're going to it. Those are that those are the kind of employees that we looked at. And we really uh, per employee and per truck our average sale increased exponentially. Uh, in fact, the first thing I did was I changed the name of the company. It was called Coach's Carpet Care when I started in 95. And when I bought the company in 97, the first thing I did was to change the name to Coach's Catastrophe Cleaning and Restoration Services. So that was the, that was the biggest change that I saw in business. And our, our top line and our bottom line grew exponentially as a result of that change in the way that we did business. Yeah, that's that's a big one. It's like hey, emergencies are more profitable and we can get people that are well suited. And it's, I think if you execute well, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, as long that's as right. you really care about people, you get people who, you know, I call them the, uh, you know, they're hungry for the urgent hero work. Yes, <laughs> it's like, that's right. I, I want the phone to ring. I want to be right. called in <clears throat> as opposed to, you know, come in and work hard nine to five you know, come in and work hard to help someone in their most difficult time. And the- that intrinsically, Nate, is what makes them feel the best is when, you know, that client comes up afterwards and she was crying when you when you got there and gave you a big hug after you've been there for four hours. And wow, I mean, you restored order and now you got fans and dehues and you're drying the place out and uh, you assure her that, you know, that it'll be okay, you know. Um, those are the things that make our people very, very excited. They love reading testimon- testimonials from customers. They love us reading them for them. Uh, even the one I just shared with you about the agent of record, that was from an agent, but it was one of our franchisees that went and did a super <laughs> job for one of his clients. So these are the things that get them, get them jacked, to get them fired up. Now, do you have, ch- do you have a- now, uh, two questions? I, wanna, I don't want to forget this, but one would be, Cause this is, I think this is fun for people to hear and think about like, how could I creatively apply this to any business? If we can see, draw that short line to like, someone really needs a result here as opposed to let's, you know, make pretty pictures. Let's get them, <laughs> let's sell them something. But then the other, I think business owners forget, you know, with a minimal CEO method and the process that I teach as a mentor and turnarounds, it's like, do you want to know what the result is if it's helping well, to do that, you got to get hungry for where are people having problems? Where are they really struggling? That's where right. does it hurt the worst? It's easy to take people's money and sell them something that sounds great. People do it every day. But to say, this is the problem. We have to solve this problem. Go. And you put all your focus on drawing that short line. I call it you know, fascinate, client fascination. Where are they underserved? Where's the most pressing problem? Let's do that first. It's like the ER, triage. Yes. You know, so many people selling thermometers for broken arms. It's like, yeah. let's go deal with, the, we got a bleeder. Let's yeah. stop the bleeding. So I guess the the piece that I would, I would love to know would be, what size is the company? What size is this operation? 1-800 water damage. We yeah. have 93 franchisees and 178 territories. So most of them own more than one territory that they're operating in hundred and I have more than one truck. So these are just the owners that we have in 800 water damage. Okay. Say that again. How many franchisees? 93. Wow. Okay. And, and how many markets? 178 territories. They call them. Now, how far does that spread? Like what areas do you cover? Uh, our territories are 350,000 people. So they had two territories be 700,000 people. If they had three, it'd be about a million. So how far do you guys reach around, uh, you know, for, how many states are you in? Like how many? I would guess we're in 30 states, but I, I don't know that for sure. So you got your hands full and you're, that's your baby. You're the president of all of that. 
Yeah. 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 Wow. That's, you got some insights there. So um, I guess the other thing would be, so you're talking to a business owner, right? We got thousands of business owners who are listening to this entrepreneurs who could be in the middle of a transition. Maybe Mm -hmm. they're struggling. Maybe they want to have more sense of purpose or they want to cut away waste. There's a lot of different struggles because people don't know where to push. What, what's, what's the button I need to push on so that I can scale this business? Obviously, you figured out a way to have sort of a semi-exit strategy while also not exiting because now you got the operation that you're president of. And um, yet there was, the, you know, there was the transition in the sale with Belfour as well. So maybe you could do, give like the top three lessons or maybe top three uh, pieces of insight that you could share with a business owner in any business, any service business and say like, you want to lead the business, you want to see things get better, you want to know where to push and what's essential? What would you share? I think that that they need to look internally and find out what what's their passion. I mean, what it's really tough to grow something if you don't have a passion for it. Mm, so true. The business, there's three things that I look for in people that are applying to, to join our team. And the first thing, certainly we talked about it a lot, but it's a heart of service. I mean, do you really enjoy helping other people in their worst moment? I mean, is that something that gives you, that just fires you up, makes you can't sleep because you're you're thinking about how you're you're just servicing somebody over the top at their worst hour of need, and and uh, so I mean, if and not everyone's wired that way, Nate. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, but I I would probably guess you know banking might not be an industry that we that does real well in our industry. The people that are good bankers, but. but you know, these are the, that's what the first thing. The second thing is, you know, do you like working hard? Do you like physical labor, working hard? I mean, when you go into somebody's basement where their sump pump backed up, or in this case, sewage came into their basement two feet deep. I mean, you got to carry all that stuff out. It's got to go up out to the curb or go out to the garage or go somewhere or out to a pod. So, you know, th- these are all things that, that even if you're the owner, and you show up at the job site, your employee is going to be looking like, well, are you going to stand there and fold your arms and sit in your uh, in your suburban or are you going to get out and help? And I, I think that people that do well in this business, you know, will get out there and work and they'll work right along with their people. They'll bring, you know, cold drinks to them and they'll be there. They'll be there till the job's done. So work, hard work is, is the second. And the third thing is your ability to adopt, to adapt. And we used to say sudden change adjusts with poise. And we'd say that all the time to our employers and to our employees, because those who can't adapt and those who can't kind of pivot when they have sudden change, uh, those are the people that probably won't be in business that long. So you said sudden change adjust with poise. Is that right? Yes. Yep. So that's sort of like a mission, a little bit of a, like a, or a mantra, a mantra. It there. is. Yeah. Poise it too. Is. It's like, there's a big change, graceful and like bootstraps, slug it That's out. That's right. That's right. I dig that. Because if you're not able to do that, this, this kind of business will kill you. It will, you know, probably figuratively and literally. Because, you. <laughs> you know, you go into Monday and you're thinking, I don't have, a, there's not a lot of stuff to do. And, you know, one phone call could change that. Your ability to expand and contract is adapting. And, mm. Some cases you have to expand very, very quickly, and uh, and put many dozens of workers on one job, and then when that job's over, you got to be able to contract quickly. Mm. Well, the bleed at the end of a job, I call it, the the labor bleed will kill you, because you know you can't charge for them at the end. Production capability, resources, sort of like business one hundred and one. You know, That's you can right. have two and a half to three times of the uh, the overhead should be the gross revenue of a good company. Yes. You don't hit that number. Why are we accumulating debt? And so a a big question before we wrap up, we're covering a lot of ground and I know it's a deep dive, but this is really good stuff. And I think a lot of businesses, this is one thing that jumps out sort of shifting gears here. They don't put systems in place, but they say they want to scale. So they might have the thinking it part down and reinvent the wheel. What advice, because I, I know there's all these systems for scaling and growth. And I'm a mentor. So I help people put those systems in place right. here all the time. Listen, I, we can't afford to put systems in place right now. We're focused on growth, but when we earn X amount, then we will. And I say, listen, you got to do it first. 
Yeah. So what's the simple message? What's the simple way to, to get the how we do this processes in place? And what advice would you give to a business owner who knows they don't have them in place right now? Well, I look at this a lot like coaching. You know, I learned a lot from my <laughs> and coaching with him and working with him. I a Hall of Fame wrestling coach myself. And if you go into practice and you don't have a purpose, you don't have a strategy and how you want to get there and you have to make it relevant to your employees. You have to, they have to be in on kind of why it's important that we're going through these strategies, why it's important that we're going through, you know, these steps that we need to take in order to reach success. Cause in the end, I want your hand raised at the end, at the end, when we shake hands, I want to know I left it all on the field. And when we look at the scoreboard, we're going to win. Well, in business winning it's on a PL. And employees who don't understand that, if they're saying, hey, I'm not really related to the PL, you are related to the profit and loss statement. Because if your losses exceed your profits, then it's not a sustainable business model and you won't have a job very long. And I don't care what the government says or how much money they kick in to help. In the end, it's not sustainable. And if it's not profitable over time, then you have an unsustainable business model and you probably will be looking for another job. So all everybody is on the team. Everybody in your employee is on your team and they need to know why these systems are so important. And where do you find those systems? You find people that are successful in your business that you have a passion for and ask them, what do you do and how do you do it? And it's amazing. And I don't care if you're in college coaching or high school coaching or in business, how many successful businesses learn from other successful businesses. Yeah. Coach off each other. That's all they do. Ask questions <laughs> and use it. If it worked in full transparency, I'm going to poach off of this. And I, right. hope, I hope everybody listening sees that yeah. none of us benefit from saying I'll handle all of that myself. I call it right. when you say how, and you try to solve it yourself, I call it huge overwhelm and waiting. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Instead, you ask who, which is who can help out. Yep. Who can you ask? It's reaching up instead of, you know, always right. trying to solve it yourself. Reach up. Yeah. Yeah. There's I no, dig that. You look at me. I don't, I don't have, there's no magic comes out of my hands. I mean, I just, but I have a lot of really good people that I've met along the line. I hopefully I've helped as many uh, as well as, as I've benefited from, but yeah. You know, Develop those relationships and you ask them questions. Well, I hope, I hope Tim, that we can stay in touch and, and you'd be willing to uh, be a resource as we continue to share insights and, and maybe even do another interview in the future and help navigate some of the questions and challenges that our listeners face. Because as business owners right now, I mean, there's been a lot of free money. There's a lot of people who don't want to work. There's a lot of people don't understand. Like I would, if I summed up what you shared here, I think we've got a solid title here. You got to have a playbook. You got to have the purpose. And you got to have a passion for it and yeah. know every single player, every single player on the team is part of the PL. That's right. They are. So, and then just sit down and say, this is how we do it. If you're unsure, if you're unclear, if you're not getting the results you want, get a mentor who's actually done it and doing it. And all you have to do is ask. Just ask. And you don't need someone in a fancy suit or with a fancy story or a fancy ad. You get someone who's actually proof of product that's out in, out in the dirt. Exactly. I think you summed it up well, Nate. Well, I couldn't have done it without your your enthusiasm, your your playbook, your purpose, and your passion. So that helped out a lot. <laughs> All right. I appreciate the time. This has been a great interview, Tim. I think that um, I think that our listeners are going to get a ton of value out of this. I know that I have, and I think just the simple insight that like sometimes you just got to hunker down and put your processes together. This is how we do it. And if you try to make it something more complicated, that don't make it where people can find it. Then you know it's the old like I spent forty grand, put my processes together. It's up there on that binder on the shelf. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the biggest consequences of business. The other part I would say of people who, who are having business problems and turnarounds is they're fighting for something they don't want. And I say, I've really got to turn this around. I said, do you want it if you win? Oh, well, since you ask, this isn't yeah. really what I want. This kind of sucks. All and right. then we help them build something different that right. awakens up that the gifts, you know, like, ah, you know, waking up excited. I know when the going gets tough and, you know, I look at what I'm trying to do in my business, working with my clients, like not only do we have an outreach where we help orphans and we help uh, the less fortunate, we have an orphanage in Peru, 
and we help with our overflow for success program. We help charities and all the places where we speak, but um, you know, it's like every one of our clients has families, has employees, has communities that are counting on them to be in alignment with their gifts and to focus on what matters instead of like that constant, like avoiding what needs to be done. That's absolutely. Let me go do this fun, shiny junk food marketing over here and forget about the work that needs attention. You know, so you've obviously figured that out or or in the process of figuring it out considerably better than most. So I I dig what you're doing. And I appreciate, Tim, the time that you spent on the podcast. Thanks, Nate. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this has been great. So uh, everyone who's listening, I'm really happy that you took the time to to join us for this interview. It's been a great interview again with Tim Fagan, the president of 1-800-WATER-DAMAGE. We got a lot of insights and background. And my suggestion might, would be to just, if you like this, if you have questions, you want to get more involved with um, you know, overcoming some of the challenges in your business, the Minimalist CEO podcast is about focusing on what's essential, asking the tough questions, stripping away the waste and the junk food, and building a helping system. And I think Tim's done a great job of sharing what that can look like from his space with 100 water damage and what he's been through. So um, go ahead and subscribe, download this, share this, ask us any questions. You can go ahead and, and visit us at The Minimalist CEO on Facebook. You can send a message to help at The Minimalist CEO and uh, someone from my team will get in touch. I make a point to review all the questions. And we for sure, if you have someone who you think would be a great guest and you have big questions about your business, or you just want some help, want to want to find out what, you know, maybe you're a little bit stuck, take advantage. That's what this is for. So reach out to us for sure. And uh, I'll put Tim, if it's okay with you, I'll put some information. So if people want to learn a little bit more about 1-800-WATER-DAMAGE, we'll put it down in the show notes so they can get in touch with you. Sure. All right. Awesome. Absolutely. All right. Thanks everyone. Again, Nate Lindquist with the Minimalist CEO podcast. Thanks for stopping by and we'll see you in the next episode.